Okay, today we're going to talk about comparing investments. We've just completed the topic on land, where we specifically looked at land investments and how to determine whether an investment is profitable. Then we looked at the financial feasibility of land investments, and we spent a little time on that because if you're going to purchase land or real estate and be a highly leveraged, meaning you're borrowing money to pay for that land, there's going to be an inherent financing gap in the early years. And we also showed you how to do sensitivity analysis with land, specifically focusing on the maximum bid price and made the point that that's important to know so when you get into the auctions uh, purchasing land that you don't offer more for the land than what would make it a good investment. Today uh, we're going to talk about comparing investment alternatives. Up till now we've specifically just looked at a individual investment to determine whether it was good or not good. Now we're going to talk about there are situations such as credit rationing or mutually exclusive investments where two investments may be good but you can only choose one of them and how do you make that comparison and we're going to talk about another decision criterion that we're going to call the annuity equivalent to help us in this decision process your reading assignment go back to chapter 11 on page 330 to 332 there's some information there that will help you in this and then I want you to go to chapter 13 on leasing non-real estate assets. And very quickly we'll go through this material and we'll then be in chapter 14 looking at the financing side of investments, looking at the cost of financial capital. Okay, we start today's lecture looking at comparing investments. And we'll start with the premise that we can accept all profitable investments. And you're well aware of that. There's lots of investments out there that you know would be good investments, but you can't invest in all of them. And there's reasons for that. One is, is when you have mutually exclusive investments. Mutually exclusive, that's a word that you picked up probably in your statistics class. And the mutually exclusive basically means that if you choose one, then you can't choose the other. Okay, there's no intersection between those two investments. It's either one or the other. And an example of that is the red tractor versus the green tractor. Okay, so you got the case uh, international that makes the red tractor, and who makes the green tractor? John Deere, the green, right? And you see that competition out there. I saw it many, many, many years ago when I was on the farm. Okay, the green versus the red. And you'll see by a picture that I show up which one of those I was biased towards. If you determine that you need a tractor on the farm, and you only need one tractor, you're not going to buy a red one and a green one, you're going to choose one or the other. And the other reason is that you can't accept all investments is capital rationing. You know, part of that is external. Some individuals, particularly the entrepreneurial firm in production agriculture, doesn't have unlimited access to equity and debt capital. You know, mom and pa farm can't go out and issue corporate debt or public traded stock, you know, to, to get more capital. And since their equity is limited, banks are not going to give them unlimited credit. So there's an external capital rationing. And we've used that example. Many of you would have liked to have purchased a rental property instead of renting while you were here. But because you had external restriction on your access to equity or debt, you didn't do it. Okay, so you understand that. But also, in some cases, it's internal. Okay, your parents may very well have the capital to purchase a house for you to live in. They could have borrowed the money to do that. But they chose not to because they didn't want to use up their credit reserves, which we'll talk about later in this class or they didn't want to use up their equity for the down payment to do that. There was some internal choices that said, no, we're not going to do this, even though they probably recognized it would have been better for them to purchase the house and pay the mortgage payment than to pay your rent. Okay? They made some choices to restrict the purchase of that house. They had other alternatives out there in their minds that were better. When you have an internal and external capital rationing, then you want to accept the most profitable. 
those that are the best that's going to increase your wealth the most in that scenario. Now we have the motivation to recognize that we do have to compare different investments and decide which of those we're going to choose. We need to have some kind of decision criterion for ranking them so that we can decide which of all the profitable investments we're going to choose, recognizing that we can't choose all of them. And the decision criterion that we're going to use, initially it'll sound complex, but you'll see in a minute what we're doing here is something we've been doing for two months now. So if you're willing to break through the verbiage, you'll see that this is a fairly straightforward concept. And the decision criterion is the annuity equivalent. And notice that I put a subscript E on the A. A is the symbol that we've been using for annuity. I'm differentiating that annuity now to call it the annuity equivalent. Okay, and you'll see why in a minute. And the definition of that is just a uniform annuity. That A, that's how we've been defining that A, is uniform annuity over the life of an investment where that annuity is equivalent to the investment's net present value. In other words, we want this annuity that would make an individual indifferent between that annuity or that net present value amount today. Now, to calculate the annuity equivalent, we first calculate the net present value, which you all have done now a number of times. You're going to calculate the net present value of the given investment that we're looking at, and then we're going to calculate the annuity. So hopefully you recognize that this formula, which used to be this V naught equals A times the US PV for R over N, this V naught now becomes the net present value. This uniform series present value a factor is the same, but because we're replacing the present value with the net present value, we now refer to this annuity as the annuity equivalent. And we call it equivalent because it's equivalent to the net present value. Instead of just any present value, it's got a specific meaning because it's equivalent to the net present value which we recognized, if you recall, was the profit over any required return to capital. Okay, the rule, once we have calculated this annuity equivalent for mutually exclusive investments where we can choose one and not the other, we're going to choose the investment with the highest annuity equivalent. And then if we have an issue where we're doing credit rationing, okay, where we can choose all of the investments in a set, but we choose not to because of external or internal credit rationing, we're going to rank them and we're going to then choose from the highest annuity equivalent to the lowest until we run out of capital. Again, if we look at this in a timeline to help us visualize better what we mean by this annuity equivalent, notice that we have the timeline and it's over the life of this investment, N. And where we have the net present value at time zero, and then we're going to calculate this A that's equivalent to that net present value. Again, I'm repeating the present value uniform annuity formula, and we're replacing this present value with the net present value, and we're replacing this A with the annuity equivalent. Otherwise, it's the same formula. So as I said, other than the verbiage where we're introducing this, the computations and the basic understanding of annuity equivalent is what you've been doing now for a month. If you can link that with your mind right now, what we're covering here is very easy. If you don't get that link right now, you're going to think that I'm introducing something really sophisticated here and hard to do, when in fact, now, this is the same thing that you did when you calculate the payment on a loan. And your calculators are well equipped to do that. If we want to show this mathematically, of course, we can solve for the annuity equivalent simply by dividing the net present value by the USPV factor. And in terms of our calculators, it's nice because for the N, we put the life of the investment. For the R, we put the discount rate. For the present value, we just put whatever the net present value was that we calculated. We zero out the future value and then we compute this payment. And that payment, you see, becomes the annuity equivalent.
So it's the exact same procedure that you did when you calculated a loan payment. On a loan payment, you said, I'm borrowing this present value amount of money for n periods at R rate, and you calculate the payment, and it gave you your annual or your per period payment. Well, the only difference is now is after you've calculated the net present value, you put the net present value into the present amount, and when you compute the payment, it becomes your annuity equivalent. Now, here's a new wrinkle to this, however, that when you're trying to calculate the annuity equivalent for investment comparisons, there's reasons to use the real annuity equivalent because if you do the nominal annuity equivalent, it, it gives us somewhat of a convoluted annual or per period amount because uh, it has the inflation adjustments that where you're paying a higher amount in real dollars in the beginning than you do at the end. Whereas if you convert this annuity equivalent to its real annuity equivalent, then you're putting the annuity equivalent in today's dollars, and then you can exponentially grow that with inflation. So it's best to use the real annuity equivalent. And if we use the real annuity equivalent, we use the real discount rate when calculating the annuity equivalent. However, remember that when you're doing the net present value, we want to use the nominal discount rate. So here's this sequential thing that you've got to have in your mind, is that when you're calculating the uh, net present value, you're going to be using the nominal rate. But then when you, you actually are looking at ranking two different investments, comparing the investments with the annuity equivalent, you've got to then remember to change that nominal rate to a real rate. And you say, well, how do we do that? Well, you already know. We've already covered it. You're going to use the real rate to appropriately account for the inflation, as I just mentioned. And this formula is something that you've already covered. In this particular case, the real rate is 1 plus the nominal rate divided by 1 plus the inflation rate minus 1. And this R, the nominal rate, is the discount rate that we used. And the discount rate that we used for calculating the net present value for this class is the after-tax risk-adjusted discount rate. And that becomes the nominal rate that you're using in this formula. Calculating the annuity equivalent, the N in that formula, is the same N as used to calculate the net present value. Or you can think of that as the planning horizon. If you're planning on keeping that tractor, that green tractor, for 10 years, and you want to find the net present value of that green tractor, you're going to be discounting its cash flows back over the 10-year period of time. And then once you know that net present value, and you want to know its annual equivalent for that tractor, you're going to then annualize it over the same planning horizon of 10 years. So that's not real complicated. Now this is something else that's nice about comparing investments. If it's known in advance that the investments are acceptable, you know, if you've already determined you need a tractor and you're just comparing the green and the red, if it's already known, you know, hey, I can't farm without a tractor, I've got to have it. If you know that, this process is simplified because common cash flows can be omitted. But if I ask you to come and give me the return specifically associated with a green tractor, how would you go about doing that? You know, the tractor is used to plow the ground, prepare the ground, plant the seeds, cultivate the seeds. Might even be used in the harvesting if you're growing cotton or some other crops. So how do you attribute the actual tractor in an enterprise budget? How much of the revenue is attributed to that tractor? Now there's ad hoc ways to do that, and, and I suspect if I ask some of you to come up and show me, you could probably come up with something. But it's not easy to do, and even after you do it, it's got a lot of holes in it. But if the green tractor and the red tractor have basically the same pulling capacity and can do basically the same work, does it make any difference? Since they're providing the same service, then that revenue is going to be the same, and then in terms of a ranking standpoint, does it make any difference? And the answer is no, and thus you can ignore that. So it simplifies this problem greatly if you understand that if you're comparing two different investments, 
you're only looking at the cost of revenues that are different in each of them. So anything that's common you can ignore and it simplifies the problem. Now, if you ignore cash flows and those common cash flows happen to be revenues, the complication is, is that your decision criteria, in this case the annuity equivalent, can actually be negative. If in the green and the red tractors, if all you're looking at is the costs, if they're the only things that are different, then the cost is negative, then you could very well have a decision criteria that is negative. And in which case then you would choose the least negative. But you've already determined that it's a viable, profitable investment, so you don't have to worry about that. You're just looking at the ranking. If you saw that negative without thinking through that process, you might, well, why should I be investing in something with a negative return? In this case, we've already determined that it's a profitable investment.